Hello, welcome back. It's been many months since I've done a video, and I'm glad I'm going to be doing some. Uh, in fact, I made a whole list of different episodes that I want to do up this coming uh, summer. So please stand by for a lot of different videos. But tonight, the video is very important. It's directed to all the Catholics and all the Protestants and Christians in the world. Okay? So be careful, be attentive, and listen very carefully to what I'm going to tell you because I'm going to tell you the truth. I studied the Holy Scriptures for over 50 years. I studied and taught them. And I'm going to tell you the absolute truth that you don't hear from Protestant ministers or Catholic priests. But I'm going to tell you tonight. So I want you to be careful. Because what I'm going to say, this announcement is going to be shocking to the religious leaders, both Catholic and Protestant. So make sure you watch the entire video to the end. Okay? Now, We've got over 2,000 denominations in the Protestant Church. Uh, we got about five or six good uh, denominations in the Catholic Church. I am sick and tired of going on YouTube and watching the Protestants attack the Catholics and the Catholics attack the Protestants. And mostly it's the evangelist fault who is doing it because he wants you to leave the Catholic Church to join his congregation. But I'm telling you, any man that, de uh, that bad mounts another Christian church is not a man of God, and you should not listen to him. Because all he's going to do is fill your ears full of lies. That's right. I'm sick and tired of listening to this. The whore of Babylon is the Catholic Church. And then the Protestants, uh, then the Catholics accuse the Protestants of being pagans and uh, uh, infidels. No, no, no. We are all children of God, Okay. Now, I'm going to make this pro proclamation right now, and I want you to be, uh, hear this. All Catholic uh, members, all Catholic people who are properly baptized are saved by grace, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. All Protestants that have been properly baptized are all saved by grace, by God's grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Then why do we have so many different churches? How we are, how come we all got each other's throats? It's theology. Theology is the study of God, his mysteries, his creation. But it also has become a curse because of Satan. Let's give you let me give you an example. You got four men right here, and they're all studying the Holy Bible together and they form their church. And they're all happy and everything. And then they come across a, a certain subject in the Bible, and three of them are in agreement, but the fourth one doesn't agree. So he goes off and starts his own church. And it, it, that, uh, that type of situation gets done over and over and over. And next thing you know, we got over 2,000 denominations in the Protestant churches. This is crazy. On YouTube right now there are tapes, videos, of uh, scientists or atheists who are uh, trying to convince you that there is no God. These are the ones you should be attacking. Protestants and Catholics should join together and attack these people. Put them down. Show them how they are wrong. Not each other. We are united in Christ. Also, how does... Uh, let me see right here. I got a thing right here that I've, uh, I want to follow. Let me talk to you about uh, uh, salvation. Okay. Now, when it comes to an adult, he learns about Jesus Christ, and then he decides to uh, accept him as his Lord and Savior, and he is baptized. And the proper way to baptize him is to say these words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The way Jesus told the apostles in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Okay, that's the proper way to baptize. And it doesn't have to be a priest. If you are a baptized person, you can baptize somebody and it will be effective. That's the way it's taught in the Catholic Church. That's the way it should be in the Protestant Church. Because we don't want to lose anybody. Everybody is loved by God. If it's a baby infant being baptized, 
then the baptism is done through the faith of the parents who are giving permission to baptize the child in the name of Jesus Christ. This is done by proxy. Just like if you uh, own stock in a company and you cannot go to their annual stockholder meeting, but you can send in your proxy for someone else to vote for you. The same thing. Jesus Christ died on a cross by proxy. That's how we are saved. We are the ones that should be on Jesus Christ. I mean, we are the ones who should be on the cross dying. That second death, but no, we were on the cross. Jesus was. And how come we are saved by faith? Because of proxy. He took our place. So it's through the faith of the parents. Now, how is baptism done? Some churches do it by submerging into the water completely. Some do it by pouring water over the head. Some do it by sprinkling. It doesn't matter. Baptism by water is by water. As long as the water touches, you know, to get into a theological uh, discussion about how it's done is ridiculous. Because if you are right that it's by submerging and I am wrong by pouring, it doesn't matter because it has nothing to do with salvation. Whether you're right or wrong about how baptism is done has nothing to do with salvation. Okay, now, when we uh, baptize, okay, let me go here, let me step back first, okay? Let me go to Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 5. It was a night of the cool in the evening, and uh, on top of the rooftop of the house, uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and they talk. And Jesus says to them in verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Unless a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? To be born of the water is, of course, baptism. To be born of the Spirit is you being given the Holy Spirit. Now, the Protestants sometimes have it wrong. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotional feeling. You don't wake up one day and you say, Oh, I love Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and Savior. And I have been fulfilled and born of the Spirit. No, it doesn't happen like that. It has to be done through the laying on of hands. It's in the back. It's in the book of Acts. There was a group of uh, people. It's in, uh, let me see here. Uh... I can give you the, uh, the verse. It's in uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 15 and 17. Now, a group of people were baptized by followers of Christ. Then the word came out, and two days later, Peter and John came and so found out that they were baptized, but they did not receive the Holy Spirit. They were not born of the Spirit, only of the water. So John and Peter laid their hands. This is the laying of the hands. And they were given the Holy Spirit. Now, how is this practiced today? Well, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's usually done at the age of 12, I believe, or 13, the age of consent, when the child has learned the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. And then he goes before the bishop, and the bishop puts a, with the holy oil, a chrism, puts a cross on his head, and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now he is born of the Holy Spirit. In the Orthodox Church, it's done either by the priest or bishop. Right after the baby is baptized, chrismation is done. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, it's called confirmation. He's confirming the Holy Spirit. And in the uh, Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, it's chrismation, where the sign of the cross is done, and he sees, and the child receives the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, how do the Protestants do it? They don't. I have never, I have attended over hundreds of, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, Protestant baptism of all different kinds of Protestant churches. And I have never, never seen the, the pastor give them the Holy Spirit. He has the authority. He baptizes them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that's it. It's over with. And then they go, and then they come out of the river. But they never received the Holy Spirit. So now what happens to them? Until you get the water and the Spirit, you can't go into the kingdom of heaven. Here's my theory. The Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, or Church of England, old Catholic churches, 
and uh, Episcopal churches, they do it the right way, and they their church members will go to heaven, to paradise, where God is. Protestants are also saved, but they will not go to paradise. They will go to another place. Where? In the book of Isaiah. Isaiah uh, sees that God creates a new heaven and new earth. This earth we live on now will be done away with. And a new heaven, new earth will be done, will be created. And it's also in the book of Revelations. If you read Revelations chapter 21, it says that uh, he creates a new heaven, new earth, and out of the sky comes holy Jerusalem, new Jerusalem, and settles on the earth. And its foundations are made up to 12 gemstones, diamonds, rubies, uh, jade, so forth. Okay? And has 12 gates. And here is where the Protestants will live. And, and probably in the countryside as well. And in this midst of the city will be a, a chair. And there the Spirit of God shall descend and be there and dwell among the Protestant churches. And the river of life will go through the river and the tree of life will be there too. So they can consume and have eternal life. In here, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more deaths. Animals will live together as friends, not tear each other apart. And God will give uh, the human race food to eat, take care of them, and so forth. I don't know what we'll be uh, doing in the kingdom of heaven, what kind of tasks he will have for us, if we have any kind of uh, special duties. But, uh, now, the Protestants have a different form of worship than the Catholics do. Well, let me start out with the Catholics first, and then we'll go to the Protestants, or half Catholic, the Protestant, and end with Catholics, okay? Now, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church follows the tradition of the Old Testament. When God commanded Moses and Aaron to build the tabernacle in which God shall dwell among his people, it was a big tent surrounded by a wall of tents, of a tent, like a wall. And inside the tent was two places, the holy, and then the second place was called the holy of holies, separated by a curtain. In the holy of holy place is an altar, and then on top of the altar is the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, it mentions in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that smoke, a white smoke, would come down out of the clouds and go right over to the holy of holies and enter the top part of the tent, and there, God will dwell between the two holy angels that are facing each other on the covenant, and he will dwell there. So he will dwell among his people. Well, the Catholic Church and the Roman and the Eastern Orthodox Church has also copied that when it comes time to uh, design churches when Christianity was no longer pursued by the Emperor of Rome. So what did they do? They built a building and they have a, 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 a forum where people cater and congregate and talk and talk. Then they enter the holy place. Orthodox churches, some of them have no pews. They just stand. Others, they sit down in pews. And then there is the icon, a wall of icons, pictures, holy pictures of saints and the apostles and Jesus, Mary. And then through the main gate, which is called the Golden Gate, is the sanctuary or the Holy of Holies. On top of the altar is a tabernacle. And inside the tabernacle, the Spirit of God dwells among his people. When it comes to Holy Communion, the priest comes down from the, the sanctuary several steps. The congregation comes up to the priest. It's like God is meeting us halfway and we have Holy Communion. Now, let's go back to the Protestants and I'll finish up with the Catholics. The Protestants have churches too. They have just buildings. Some churches I have been in, I'll be fair, had glass stained windows of holy windows of Jesus and so forth. Uh, others just had nothing, but just a, a, a room with pews, a piano or organ, a podium for the uh, pastor to do a sermon, and another stand over here for the lay people to do reports of what's going on in the church. In the Protestant churches, they have prayers. They have songs, 
a praise. They have uh, lectures. They have a sermon by the uh, minister, so forth. And when they go into the church, they just go into the pews and sit down. Why? Because there's nothing up front. There's just chairs for the elders or just a blank table and that's it. But in a Catholic church, an ancient Orthodox church, the people come in and they genuflect. They go down on one knee and make the sign of the cross. Why? Because there in front of them is the altar with the tabernacle and the presence of God is right there. So that's why they genuflect. To show respect to God. Protestants don't believe in having the presence of God there. So they don't genuflect. They don't make the sign of the cross. So that's uh, that's their that's their choice of form of worship. If they're happy with that, God bless them, and that's all that matters. God doesn't really care as much as how we do the worship, as long as we do the worship. That's important. However, we chose to follow after God's instruction, because if you remember, it mentions in the Holy Scriptures that the tabernacle or the ch uh, church. Uh, of the holy holy place in heaven is identical to the one on earth that's why God gave that instructions so let's end with the uh, Catholics so when you enter a Roman Catholic church or Orth Eastern Orthodox church you'll see a font with water that is holy water the purpose of there is to put your finger into it to get it wet and make the sign of the cross and to bless yourself you know, we live in a wicked world, and it's crazy enough as it is. And believe me, we can use all the blessings that we can get. And that's the blessing number one. When you walk into the uh, church, you'll see statues. You'll see icons, holy pictures. And it will give you an air that you're in a very holy place. I mean, you'll get that feeling right away. Statues are not worshipped. That's the Protestants' way of lying and trying to convince their members not to leave their church, not to join the Catholic Church. But everybody knows they are there only to remind us of the great things that that person has done. For instance, Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, how he took care of Jesus, taught him how to be a carpenter, how he loved him as his own son. So we venerate him, we respect him, we think about him. Same with Mary, the theologian, Theotokos, as the Orthodox call it, the God-bearer. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has the, uh, the Holy Mass, the liturgy. When you go and you sit down in the pew, we have prayers, we have songs, okay? And we have uh, the lay people do their, uh, uh, you know, um, message. We have someone, uh, one of the deacons, read the epistle. Then we have a reading of the Holy Gospel. Then the pastor will get up and do a sermon and preach on the Word of God. Then we have the Holy Eucharist, the communion, where right before on the altar table is the host and wine, and God is, uh, the priest is blessing it and making it holy, and he calls down the Holy Spirit to change the bread and wine into the living essence of Christ, of his body and blood. This is not a memorial. This is real. Okay? In the Holy Scriptures in the New Testament, Jesus says, you must eat the body, my body, and drink my blood, or you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You, got, you, know what? you can't do that in a memorial. Okay? It has to be the real thing. So, uh, we have Holy Communion. Now, before we have Holy Communion on Saturdays, uh, the congregation will go and, uh, to confession before a priest uh, and confess their sins of Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Well, in the middle of the uh, confession booth is the priest, and at the end is the prisoner. And then they, he, she, she or he opens up the s a screen, which they can't see each other, but they can hear each other. And, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. It's been three weeks since my last confession. And it goes in. Now, they know that uh, they're doing this with Jesus Christ there because when Jesus Christ said, two or more are gathered in my name, there will I be. And right in the booth with the priest is Jesus Christ hearing 
the confession. And when the priest goes, you are absolved, I forgive you of your sins, it's the priest's voice, but it's Jesus Christ using the priest's voice when he says you are forgiven. And that person is forgiven by Jesus Christ, not by the priest. I hope that's an understanding. Now, when I have uh, uh, Protestants come to my uh, my church or my chapel for Holy Mass, and they have not gone to confession, well, at the beginning of my Mass is uh, uh, confession time. I come out, I greet the, and salutate the Holy uh, the Holy Trinity, and I go up to the altar and kiss it. And I come back down, and I bend over and I say the prayer of confession, which is called the Confidior. And I will go back and forth and mourn for my sins as I pray for forgiveness. And then I turn to the congregation, say something, and then the congregation does the same prayer and confesses their sins. And as a big, massive group, I turn around and I absolve them of all their sins, and they are forgiven. Then they are allowed to take Holy Communion. Since we believe in the presence of Christ uh, in the Holy and there's nothing wrong with that. If a Protestant were to say, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is in the bread and wine, they're not going to go to hell just because they believe that. And whether I am right that his presence is there, or you are right and the, and the presence isn't there, doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with salvation. So, uh, we go up to communion. Now, since I'm a strong believer in the presence, uh, in the middle of the Mass, before we get to the High Mass, and before I call the Holy Spirit down, I, first of all, I anoint myself, and then I anoint my, consecrate my hands. Because I'm going to be holding the essence of the Creator. So it's very important. Remember that story in the Old Testament where David, King David, was bringing the Ark of the Tab Tabernacle, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, back to Jerusalem to, to be its holy place? And it's stumbled some over some rocks, and the covenant was going to act the covenant was tipping, it was going to fall off the wagon, and the soldier went and grabbed it and pushed it back, and he died instantly. His hands was unconsecrated, and he held something very holy, and he died. I'm pretty sure God uh, went ahead and took his soul to heaven, but nonetheless, that's what happened. So in my communion, when I have uh, people come up. I do not put the host into their hands so they can, because their hands have not been consecrated. I put it on their tongue. I dip it into the wine so they get the bread and the wine and I put it on their tongue. And as we do this every Sunday or every day, our body becomes saturated with the essence of Christ. And the, the, the chance of us sinning is less and less and less because His power is growing within us. So that's how the Catholics and Orthodox celebrate uh, the liturgy. And uh, those Protestants who are happy with uh, their way of forming, uh, worshiping God, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if they wanted to uh, go to a place that's a little bit more holy, and you get to feel that in your heart. See, in the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church, we celebrate the Mass by using all five senses of our human existence. We, f we, we taste, we feel, we hear, we see, we smell. Because uh, at every Mass, the priest uh, uses incense, and incense is the altar. Why? Because it's, it's mentioned in the Revelation that uh, uh, John wrote that uh, uh, God appeared to Aaron and told him, you know, when you pray, burn incense. Burn incense. In heaven, they burn it 24 hours a day, incense. The angels do. Because the incense is sweet, smelling, fragrant, and takes your prayers right up to God. So we incense in the church. Protestants don't incense. But it's in the Bible that we should, if we want to hear, have God hear us. Now, these are the things that I'm talking about. But they have nothing to do with salvation. The only thing that required in salvation, and Paul was right, is faith in Jesus Christ. 
Now, how do we know that that faith is really faith and this not faith? Human nature is so full of sin that you could lie and then go out and do something different. That's why James writes that faith, faith without works is dead. Oh, that's okay. I know Jimmy. He lives across the street. Okay? And he decides, I believe in Jesus Christ. I want to be saved. He's baptized everything. Now he's saved. But then you see him a couple of days down uh, walking into a bar with a hooker. Or he uh, ends up uh, stealing and robbing a convenience store. Now to God, when he sees this, he knows that the works that that man, that Jimmy is doing, shows an example that he is not saved. He really did not believe in Christ. Had he believed in Christ, he would be doing those kind of things. So the works is a checkpoint for God to see if we are really telling the truth that we are saved. Okay, uh, so I wake up and I go uh, downtown Cleveland and there's an old lady who wanted to cross the street. So I help her. I stop the car so we can get across to the other side. I teach the boy and the Boy Scout the good things about the uh, moral teachings. I uh, uh, go ahead and walk out of the drugstore and there's this guy in a wheelchair. He has no legs and he's selling pencils for a dollar so he can earn some extra money. And I put the dollar in his cup. Well, I don't take a pencil. And he says, thank you. I said, no, just keep it. Sell it to the next person. I'm doing good deeds. Why? Because I have the happiness of Christ in myself and my works prove it but works does not save you only faith works is only a test to see if you really have the faith so that's a, another theological uh, debate that Protestants have the Protestants just can't seem to understand that works doesn't save the Catholics don't believe that works save it's only a test to see if you are saved that's all. Salvation is through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I hope that this will help you understand. Stop fighting among each other. We're all Christians. We're all brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We're the same family. Let's go against the people like the atheists who put up all kinds of stuff about God. That there is no God and this and that and tearing down our society. Those are the ones we should join together and to go against not each other. So please, listen carefully. A man of God who badmouths another Christian church is not a man of God. Okay. God bless you. You have my blessing. And I look forward to seeing you in my next video. Amen.